Let me start before we get too deep in this. How many people, how many people, yeah, everything's a trap. How many people believe that the Bible is, is definitely the word of God? Beautiful. Let's move on. So with that said, we're going to start. Uh, and the very first verse we're going to start at is Genesis 1.11. So let's pull that up now. Uh, let's see here. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seed, and fruit trees, bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth, and it was so. Uh, then moving into Genesis 1.12. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and the trees bearing fruit in which their seed, each according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Moving into 13. And evening passed and morning came, making this the third day. Okay, so what just took place on the third day? Anyone just... Nature and plants. Nature and plants. Let's get to sea creatures. That's going to be Genesis 120. And God said, let the water team with living creatures and let birds fly above the, above the earth, across the vault of the sky. Genesis 121. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves in uh, uh, with, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. And Genesis 122. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply the earth. Genesis 123. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So what happened on the fifth day? Fish and birds, fifth day, right? Third day was nature. The fifth day is fish and birds. Okay, Genesis 124. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. Genesis 125. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and of the heavens and over the livestock and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Who has dominion of the earth? Man. Okay, let's move, keep going here. John, uh, Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I'm going to clear this up real quick, and I've mentioned it before. That's the Trinity, right? God created us in his image. That is mind, nature, right? Body, Jesus, right? Spirit, Holy Spirit. We are created in God's image. Let's look next verse Genesis 128 and God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and over the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth so you have dominion clear as day let's move into 29 and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of this earth, and every tree with the seed in it, you shall have them for food. And 30. And every beast to the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant of food, and that was so. 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Okay, what happens on the seventh day? He rested, right? So what comes next after this verse? Let's go here. 131. Let's go to one. Uh, let's go to Genesis 2:1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. It's all done. That's the first creation. Now I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. Where's the tree of good and evil? Where's the tree of life? In the garden. Really? Where? It just said that all of these things are good to eat. Do you miss that? Did you miss that? We're done, so you can't backtrack. It's not like, oh, well, he's going to add it next. No, it's over. The earth was completed. It's done. <laughs> you also notice that Adam and Eve were made at the exact same time. But I just wanted to, in passing, show you how we miss things. Right? Yeah. We're just warming up. All right. 
second creation story. That's going to bring us to Genesis 2-4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh God made the earth and heavens. Did you ever hear Yahweh get mentioned to the entire first creation ever once? Did I even mention the Lord once? Now we got Yahweh God. Because there's a whole other time we were talking about. We were talking about Elohim. Now, do I need to go back and show you guys who Hel Elohim is? Elohim is the plural God. Let us make man in our image, right? We discovered that. Behold, man has become as us, right? Knowing good and evil. Elohim is the plural God. You're gonna see that, and you're gonna see that in the second creation, but you're gonna see it blended with the singular. Let's move to the next one, Genesis 2, 5. When no brush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. What's going on here? Let's go to 2.6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Then the... Okay, now we're at Genesis 2.7. Bear with me, guys. Then the Lord God, Yahweh God, formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So we have no vegetation. Here, Adam's getting created. Let's go to 2.8. Now look what happens. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. The east of there, he put the man whom he had formed. So let's see this garden real quick. So when we click on garden, see what it really is. It could be a garden, but it also can be an enclosure, right? What it says. And we know there's no trees, just said so. But it gets even more peculiar when we go a little further here. Now the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. So, so apparently all nature happened after Adam then. Or was it before Adam on the third day? Which one is it? So why are we getting in one creation, nature and all nature was created on the third day, and now we're getting in the next creation that, no, Adam was already made, and then all nature was made. And that's the sixth day, that's three days later. Now what does he say here? It goes into the tree of good and evil, right? And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight. So there wasn't before. So this is every tree, no. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the feet. But didn't that happen before Adam? So we're on the sixth day. Animals haven't been made yet. Nature hasn't been made yet. Now man is made. Now nature is made. But Adam's lonely. So now we're going to make animals. The Lord God caused man. Now we're going to get Eve. This is after the fact, because he couldn't find a helpmate, right? Oh, no animal was suitable. Do I need to read it? Do I, need, do I have to go through all these? I don't even need to read it, right? Couldn't find a helpmate that was suitable. So now we're going to get Eve, and that's going to come from a rib. You never heard that story in the first creation. These are two different, completely different stories. And you have two different gods in those stories. One is Elohim, which is many gods. And in the second story, all of a sudden you have Yahweh Elohim, which is one of those Elohim. Now, now that I've put it in a nutshell, that's two different creation stories, unless you can argue the point. You have to understand where Abraham came from. Does anyone know where Abram came from? And I do mean Abram before he got the name Abraham. Does anyone know where he was called out of? Ur of Chaldeans, which is Mesopotamia, right? And this is, we're talking ages ago, right? Does anyone know what his father did for a living? Oh, he's an idol maker. He makes idols. Abraham's father is an idol maker. They come out of Mesopotamia, which is where, which is Babylon, which is where all of the Elohim, where they worship tons of gods, right? Uh, so that, that one could argue that their entire family is involved if his dad is making idols and they come from a place where lots of gods are worshipped, no doubt, no doubt, then one could argue that he comes from a family of pagan worshippers, pagan idol worshippers, bulk god worshippers. What I'm arguing is, is that Moses did not write the entire first five books of the Old Testament. I believe that what you have happening is syncretism. I believe that you have Moses writing some books and I believe that you have older texts that are getting blended with those books. 
So just like I do believe that Moses wrote Genesis, I also believe that not all Genesis is written by Moses, as I just proved, unless Moses completely forgot what he wrote the first time. And then why did he decide not to add Yahweh's name in it, but then decided to add Yahweh's name in it in the second creation? What you're getting is a blending of ancient Mesopotamian gods, Elohim, groups of gods, and then you're getting Moses, who is set later, much later, brought over by a bush and says, I never told him I was Yahweh. I told him I was hell. How do you think you got the Elohim one right? <laughs> is that what he says to Moses? I never told him my name was Yahweh. They knew me as El Shaddai. Everyone knows El Shaddai. That's the ancient Mesopotamian El Almighty. Now, mind you, you're going, man, you're jumping leaps, Matt. You're going to, how would you come up with this when no one else did? That's called the documentary hypothesis. Almost every single scholar is very well aware of what I'm saying. So if you're not involved regularly in study, you're not going to know that everything I'm telling you is well known. Now, we're not going to get hung up on this because if you really want to look into this, I've given you what you need to know. And I didn't even have to show you this. That's the reason I didn't start with it. I just had to show you how we both agreed that the Bible is word for word accurate. And then I showed you how it completely contradicted each other before you even got to Genesis 2 from Genesis 1. Now we're gonna start getting into some, some, some craziness, all right? Psalms 82, one, we see a Psalm of Asaph. God standeth. So this verse that I'm about to bring you are, are again, very controversial, but we're, I think we're gonna work it out right now. So. A Psalm of Asaph, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judges among the gods. Are there other gods? So let's go a little further here. 82, two. How long, now this is him questioning them. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Salah? This is 82, three. Now he's telling them what they should do. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. 82.4. Deliver the poor and the needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. So he's telling them what they should be doing. 82.5. They know not neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All the... They walk in darkness. Remember that word because in about four hours we're going to be bringing it back up again. <laughs> Texas his watch. <laughs> I don't think we'll be here. They, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk all in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Right? Go to the next verse here. 82.6. I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Sons of God. Old Testament. I said your gods, right? What did he say? But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So are they men? They're not men, are they? No, because they will die like men. So they're not men. So there are other gods. We have no argument here. There are other gods. There are other gods in charge. He's asking them how long you're going to continuously do this and, and judge them incorrectly. You should be doing this and you should be doing that. I'm telling you, I know I said you're gods. I know that you're all sons of God, but you're still going to die like men if you keep it up. There's no doubt that that's what the scripture is saying. Why this is argued, I don't know. I mean, I, I believe it's easily discoverable right here, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what version you use either. It's very clear. But you will die like mere mortals. Nevertheless, like men, you will die. But like mortals, you will die. But ye shall die like men. But ye shall die. They are gods. They will die like men. In King James, mm -hmm. it says, Ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Right. Principalities, powers. There are, and again, this is that's much further, but you'll also notice Jesus says, The prince of this earth is coming, and he has nothing in me, right? So. You have, and while we don't have it yet, um, but it's next, it's coming. Uh, you have where all of these nations have been allotted an angel over them. And these angels have become these kings. Now, Deuteronomy 32, eight. This is where things are gonna get wonky, but stay with me here. Uh, let's see here. 
When the Most High, that's L, when the Most High, or El Elyon, which is what the Most High is, El Elyon, the Most High, gave the nations their inheritance, right? When he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. What do you get out of that verse, anybody? Just that, before we get to the next part, what do you get out of that verse? Anybody, who can break that verse down for you? That basically, El Shaddai mm -hmm. divided up the land mm -hmm. and gave a portion, one portion to each one of his sons. Yeah, exactly. Each one of his, who's his sons? Angels. This is where your prince came from. So here we see that it is very controversial, sons of Israel. Uh, number in the heavenly court. But as we already saw in the previous verse, I'd argue it nips this question in the bud. We know that there is a council that God has. He sits in the midst of that council, right? And now that council has been separated and put over the nations. We'll see it clear as day, right? And so what takes place here, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Deuteronomy 32.9 For Yahweh's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of the inheritance. What just happened there? Did one of the sons of God get a portion? Does that mean that Yahweh's an angel? Is that what just happened right there? That's what it sounds like, isn't it? That's pretty suspect. What just happened there? <laughs> Did Yahweh get a portion? You don't see that every day. So if we've come to these are my little notes. So let's say that this suggests that Yahweh is one of the sons of God. Therefore, he's an angel. Now, as you see in my next note here, that's a pretty huge claim. And you're going to would assume that I would have to have some form of evidence that he's an angel. If I can make that claim, now I'm. you would assume the Bible has to is gonna have to be to be able to carry that claim, right? Right? That, right? I'm gonna have to have evidence. I can't just make that off of that one statement. I could, but one could say that's flimsy. So now we need to find evidence that he's an angel. That's what we need to do. So let's go ahead and do that. Yahweh the angel, Genesis 32, 24. And stay with me, because we're gonna have an oh man moment here in a minute. Now. A brief, brief note, out of everything I'm telling you tonight, there's also shadows, typology, hidden messages, hidden meanings. I am not going to cover any of those tonight. Genesis 32, 24. And Jacob was left alone, a man, remember Jacob was Yahweh's portion? Yeah, Jacob becomes Israel. Right. Okay. And Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Who's this man that wrestled with him? Who's this man wrestling with Jacob? Genesis 32, 25. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, who didn't prevail against Jacob? The man. So the man's getting beat up? Is that what you're telling me? Not losing. Not winning. He's, he's definitely not winning. Not winning. He's definitely not winning. Uh, let's see. The man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob. He touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled him. What just happened there? Well, that's a good God we worship. He's a cheater. Not only is he getting his butt handed to him, the God of war, by the way, but he also has to cheat to overcome. So he knocks his joint out. And of course, you know, that's going to hurt Jacob. He's going to crumble, right? And he said, let me go. And the man is begging to be like, oh, now. No, that's neat. <laughs> he said, let me go. Uh, what does he say? Uh, For it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, hip already busted. Still got him on lockdown. I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he's looking for a blessing from this guy, right? And of course he is, because he thinks the same thing everyone else thinks. Uh, which I don't know how we would come to that conclusion wrestling a man. So, <laughs> <laughs> while being cheated, and, and while he's winning. <laughs> Why would you need a blessing from a guy you just beat up? Uh, then the very next one here, we see where he calls him Israel. Uh, let's see. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince has thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. So here, 
I mean, the guy's admitting that he just got his butt handed to him, and he's so impressed by it that he literally makes him the name of Israel. Unless you see a different way of taking everything we just read. So you're saying mm -hmm. that's Yahweh? No. No. No, I'm saying the Bible's saying it is, but I haven't got to that yet. Okay. <laughs> he said, What no, do you I'm think? Like, Who do you think that is? The God of. The Most High, L? No, not the Most High. Mm -hmm. So just a random guy. One of the angels. Yeah, and the portion of, of Israel. Had the portion of Israel, right? right? So. A random angel. You you would say this is just an angel. You would say this is just an angel that's in charge of this nation. Right? That's what everyone would say. Okay, good. Very good. And it's called a man, so how can I come to the conclusion that that would be Yahweh? Hosea 12, 4. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor and found him at Bethel and spoke with him there. Who's him? The Lord, or Yahweh God of armies, or Yahweh God of war, Yahweh is his name, or Yahweh is his memorial, or Yahweh is his renowned name forever, depending on which version you want to use. So, that man was an angel who calls himself Yahweh. So that means an angel named Israel, an angel got bested, an angel cheated, and an angel claims to be God. All right, we've come to the conclusion that no one can argue that, that this is an angel. Uh, and we'll go a little bit deeper here. Uh, Exodus 19, 17. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, El, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Yahweh had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. So let's go on a little bit further here. Acts 7.38, let's see who this was. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai with our fathers. He received the living oracles to give to us. Okay. So he is an angel, which obviously explains how Exodus 33:11 is taking place. Thus the Lord, thus Yahweh, used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So Yahweh speaks to Moses face to face. So that means that apparently this is a lie. Exodus 33:20. And he said, "Thou cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live." <laughs> so what's going on here? Well, clearly that's not going to work because when we get to Colossians 1.15, we're much clearer on what's going on here. Jesus, right, who is the image of the who? Invisible God. <laughs> a little Did, louder for the people yeah, back. Yeah, a little louder for the people back. Did invisible change in the centuries that we've known what the word meant? Let's find out. Probably not. Invisible, unseen, invisible. No, it has not. Unseen, invisible. And Moses sits face to face with Yahweh, unseen and invisible. Good, we'll move on. Exodus 3 6, just jumping up a little bit here. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and Moses did what? Why? Because people weren't dumb. They know that you can't look at God. So how is it later we've got Moses and Yahweh hanging out, sitting face to face? People already knew that you couldn't look at God. This was already an expectation. This is why he covered his face. All right, so speaking of Moses, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Moses scenario at Mount Sinai. Exodus 32, 14. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now, do I need to give you guys some context here? He's going to go, God's going to kill them all, Yahweh. Yahweh's going to go down. He wants to crush them all. But what does Moses do? He talks them out of it. Well, that's Wonderful. Now we know we have a God we can talk out of things. Don't do it. 
<laughs> That's fantastic. And not only do we know we have a God that we can talk out of things, it's a representation that God changes his mind. Right? Repenting means two things. It means sorrow, forgiveness, and change your mind. He, he repented. He changed his mind. He felt sorrow, right? Did you ever, do you believe that God needs to repent? So what you're telling me right now is that you fully agree with me that so the Lord repented of the evil. So you're telling me that Lord, Yahweh, is not God. Because you just told me that God doesn't need to repent. Yeah. The We're Lord, on the same page. The Lord mentioned in that verse, not my God. Right. Which this is the same Lord. Mentioned in all your verses. Well, good thing we see in Numbers 23, 19 that Daniel is completely correct. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. So God doesn't need to repent. Well, let's talk about Jesus. God is not a man that he should lie or repent. It's simple. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? What does that mean? God never changes. When he speaks, it happens. Does he speak and not act? It's clear what it means. No, when he speaks, it's going to happen. And of course, because what God does that remind you of? Make your yeses yes. Does this remind you of a God you know of? And make your noes no, because I don't need to repent. Make your yeses. Who said that? Who said make your yeses yes and your noes noes? That's Jesus, by the way, your real God. Because this God that we saw previous to this verse needs to repent. So he needs to do change his mind. But here we see that God doesn't need to change his mind. And Jesus says, yeah, because I make my yeses yes and my noes noes. I don't require changing my mind and repenting. <laughs> it's, it's just that simple. So that means that this ain't Jesus. Now, James 1.17, let's see if Jesus ever changes his mind. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, and whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. You see that word shadow there? Have we talked about shadows in this, in this world? Do you think that it's a coincidence that he used the term shadow? There are shadows going on throughout the entire Old Testament. God isn't the shadow, everything around God is. So God never changes, but the shadows do. Hebrew 13.8, again, a little bit more confirmation on that. We also see that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Again, he never changes. Never changes his mind, which means he never needs to repent. Jesus specifically said, make your yeses, yeses, and your noes, noes. And what did he say after that? Anything else is from the evil one. <laughs> I mean, it's clear as day. So, okay, we got that. All right, First Chronicles 2.15. Once again. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and God sent an angel on to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying it, Yahweh beheld, and he repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed it, it's enough, stay now thy hand. Okay, so here in this verse we see he's not only doing evil, right? How many times does Jesus do evil? Zero. Here he's doing evil. Uh, it says here, and God sent an angel into Jerusalem to destroy it, and he was, and while he was destroying, Yahweh beheld, and he repented of the evil. I mean, help. So, so let me get this straight. Your God needs to repent from evil. Uh, if I'm mistaken on what that verse says, clean house right now. Jesus Christ needs to repent from evil. I I'm going to just leave that right there for you. You go ahead and tell me how that works out for you. It's not going to work, is it? No. God doesn't repent from evil. Uh, okay, so Matthew 18.10. We're going to take a look at, now the Bible tells us, right? The Bible teaches us that we will know him by his works. That's exactly what Jesus says, right? You'll know him by his works, right? So let's take a look at this, Matthew 18.10. See that you not see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now we brought that verse up in passing church, right? This is a threat. If you if you believe anything that that 
that Moses and them believed in ancient times that they needed to hide their face. What did he just say? See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my father. Well, if they're not dying from looking face to face with God, you might want to be weary of these angels. <laughs> that sounds like a threat to me. Don't talk crap. Don't touch these kids. Don't mess with them. Because while you can't look at God and live, their angels sit face to face with God. So go ahead and talk crap if you want about those kids. <laughs> that's pretty clear. That's a threat. He's making it very clear. Don't touch these kids. That's what he's saying, right? All right, well, let's take a look at this. 2 Kings 2, 23. Uh, he went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys, some kids, right, came out of the city and jeered at him, chanting, Go up, you bald head! Go up, baldy! And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of Yahweh, and two she-bears came out of the woods and tore all 42 boys up. I'll let, you, let that resonate for you for a moment. Same guy? This is the same guy that said, don't you dare touch these children for their angels sit face to face with the father? This guy? Oh, bald head. Oh, let's send two grizzlies out so we can maul 42 kids. How dare you say he's bald? Let's move on. Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. All right, we're still, we're still checking to know if we know them by their works, aren't we? And in, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So what verse, who, who are they talking about in this verse? Who's the God of this world? Yahweh. Satan, the guy who's taking your authority. You're not the God of this earth anymore, you lost that. You gave that, that was the big hustle. So the God of this earth, blinds the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Well, everyone's saying, well, I saw God. I'm talking to him face to face. Jesus is the image. There is no other image. There is no other face. No random angel came down and said, I'm God. And anyone would really credibly believe it in Jesus' time because Jesus is God. He is the image of God. So unless they were talking to Jesus, and we know they weren't because Hebrews already made that clear, then they aren't talking to God. So the God of this world is Satan, who has blinded their eyes. Deuteronomy 28.8 For Yahweh shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. Who's the God of this world again? And the God of this world blinds their minds, and Yahweh will afflict you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. Who's the God of this world? <laughs> I mean... Hello! <laughs> That's clear. Yeah. Okay. We also know that Satan tempts with evil, such as in the garden, as well as tempting Jesus in the desert, right? James 1.13. Let no man say that when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. What did you just learn of that verse? God can't be tempted with evil, and he doesn't tempt man with evil. Is that what you just learned in that verse? Yep. Uh, so, and how about the whole book of Job, right? We're going to hit that. <laughs> uh, is this not Yahweh being tempted? Okay. Job. Speak of the uh, devil. <laughs> 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 Stay with me. <laughs> so, and Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yeah, all that. I'm, uh, Satan answered Yahweh, mind you. Satan answered Yahweh and said, skin for skin, yeah, all that a man hath, he will give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to, to your face. Well, we know that's not going to happen. <laughs> You're not going to be able to see him face to face. <laughs> but it's true, God, right? So what, is, what, is, what does Yahweh say here? Oh, let's see. All right, do with him as you please. I just thought it said that Yahweh couldn't be tempted and Yahweh doesn't tempt anyone. Now, excuse me if I'm wrong, but did this, did Satan just tempt Yahweh to do evil to a man and then Yahweh go, e you know what? Yeah, go ahead, do that. Just don't hurt him, just don't kill him. You can do everything else, don't starve. Was Yahweh 
tempted by Satan to commit evil to prove a point. Yes. Yes, he was. But I thought the verse we just saw, that God is not, cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone. Uh, let's see here. 1 Kings 20, 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of Yahweh, Smite me. What does smite me? Right? Kill me. Okay, let me get this straight. Let me, let me read it again. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor, Look to the side of him. Hey, hey, Brian, come over here. Kill me. Unless you see it differently. That's what I see. Right? Or smite me. Or hit me. Or whatever. It's the same concept, right? I want you to hit me as hard as Right? We got a little fight club going on in this verse, right? <laughs> Watch what he says here. And the man refused to hit him. That's a that's a good that's a Brian, you're gonna be like, I'm not gonna walk over there and just beat you down. Like Yeah, but yeah, but Yahweh told me that I needed to come tell you that you need to come over here and you need to you need to just smite me down. But the man refused. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna strike him. <laughs> First Kings 2036. Then he said to him, Because you have not obeyed the voice of Yahweh, behold, as soon as you have gone from me, a lion shall strike you down. And as soon as he had departed from him, a lion met him and struck him down. <laughs> Clearly the works of Jesus. So, did Yahweh just tempt a man to do evil and then turned around and killed him for not doing it? Yeah. Well, that's two we've covered. I, I, do I need more? I don't think I do, but that's two we've covered, right? Uh, how it all came to this, uh, you pretty much know, but I'm going to give that real quick. The tree of life, Jesus is the tree of life. He's also the bread of life. Uh, as we see here, uh, Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. So Jesus is the tree of life. Um, this is all how all this happened. Uh, the tree of good and evil, God of good and evil. Uh, that is actually Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and I create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I, Yahweh, do all things. What did you pick? You obviously didn't pick the bread of life. You picked the God of good and evil. You picked the tree of good and evil. And Yahweh clearly says it right here. Uh, we'll look it up in Hebrew here. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. What's calamity? Bad, evil. So Yahweh is the tree of good and evil, right? We, it's clear as day. No way to get out of it. Uh, do all these things. Well, Jesus doesn't do any of those things. He just says, I am the tree of life. Want to live forever? Follow me. <laughs> That's clear as day. And how does this all play a part? Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness? They disobeyed God and became servants to the tree of good and evil. Now, why does all this matter? What was the big hustle? Because of Romans 4.15. Because the law worketh wrath. Where, for where no law is, there is no transgression. What is Father saying? Father is saying, don't touch that tree. Just be my children for, you have kids, right? Just stay this little forever and be my kids. And I'll be called father and you'll be called my sons, right? But don't go over there because you're gonna go on, you're gonna put yourself under the law, which is what they did. They put themselves under the law of knowing what is good and evil, which is the God they went under who gave them the law of good and evil. So he's like, he's on the whole time where there is no law, there is no transgression. Don't touch that tree. Well, you're going to go under the law and you're going to lose your kingship and your authority and you're going to make him God and he's going to put you on the law. Okay. Proverbs 4, 18. We're going to take a look at, we're going to do some contrast real quick. We're, we're, we're nailing it down here. Uh, Proverbs 4, 18. Let's get an idea on what, how things should look. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more onto the perfect day. What is the path of just? Light, right? Can you read that verse any other way than what's stated? The path of just is a shining light that shineth more and more onto the perfect day. In fact, that's even telling you how your salvation should work. 
right? It's dark, it's grimy, but it gets a little brighter, gets a little brighter, gets a, more and more until you're per, until the perfect day, which is the glorification. After you die, you get glorified, that's the perfect day. So it's actually telling you how you should be a Christian, right? We're gonna struggle, it's gonna be crappy, but it's gonna get better. We're gonna, we're gonna get better at it because we're living in the spirit. It's gonna get lighter, we're getting out of darkness. We're getting lighter, lighter until the perfect day when we're glorified, the body of light. If that's what the perfect is, then what's going on here in the next one? Proverbs 4.19. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Welcome to the Old Testament. You don't even know what God you're dealing with. You don't know what you're stumbling over. You are in darkness in the Old Testament, and you don't even know what you're talking about. The only true God leads to light, but everyone else is in darkness. Well, how does that relate? Well, that's, that's very simple. Take a look here at 1 Kings 8.12. If you're in deep darkness, guess who your God is? Guess what? If you're walking in darkness, you've got a God, and it ain't the God you think it is. Oh, well, let's take a look at Yahweh here. Then spake Solomon, the Yahweh said that he would dwell in what? Oh, that's clear. So if you're in darkness, guess who your God is? Uh-oh. Guess who your God is if you're walking in darkness? Yahweh, right? Or the angel of the Lord as we've already proven, is an angel. Look at this. Then spake Solomon, Yahweh said that he would dwell in thick darkness. Let's go to Hebrew real quick. Then spoke Solomon, Yahweh said he would dwell in the dark cloud. Huh, see that? In the dark cloud. Okay. Yahweh dwells in the dark cloud. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So let me get this right. Father is in a bright cloud. <laughs> are, are, are we on the same page, people? And the angel of the Lord, or Yahweh, is in a dark cloud. If you're walking in the light, you're walking with your God, the light. Jesus, who is life. If you're walking in darkness and you're walking with their God, who is in the dark cloud. Clear as day. Yeah. Clear as day. Psalms 1811. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds in the sky. Well, that's interesting. That's Yahweh. First Timothy 6.16. Who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. That's clear. Whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Oh, so Father lives in unapproachable light, whom no one can see or ever has seen. Does that backtrack us a few verses? <laughs> I think that does, doesn't it? Okay, I'm glad we cleared that up. John 12, 46. So if you're in darkness and you're under this God of darkness, guess what Jesus came to do? I have come a light into the world and whosoever believeth in me should no longer abide in darkness. Someone came to get you out from that God. Someone came to pull you out from darkness. Someone came to remove you from a worldly law. Someone came to remove you from who you think God is. That's clear. <laughs> Jesus isn't double-minded. He didn't decide to put you under a law and then later decide to kill himself to get you off from under it. <laughs> That's clear. Okay. I have come as a light into the world, and whosoever believeth on me, they should no longer abide in darkness. John 8, 12. Even more clear. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We're done with the darkness. We're done with the dark clouds. We're done with the nonsense. John 1, 17, and this will clean it up. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So what is truth? Jesus, right? The law was given through Moses, but grace and, if, if Jesus is truth, that don't say much about Moses. And guess what? Does the law set you free? Sound like a familiar verse you know? 
Then you will know the truth, which you do now, and the truth will set you free.